Hi everyone. In this talk, I'm going to talk about dynamic averaging load balancing on cycles. This is a joint work with Dan Alistair and Georgi Nadjazev from IST. So let's get right into it. The class of problems which I'm going to talk about is the balls into bins processes. The balls into bins processes are a class of problems where M weights are placed in N bins using some random procedure. And the goal is to find out how the weights are distributed between the different bins. This class of problems have been used to model several allocation problems such as load balancing, hashing, or even some relaxed data structures. A classic version of the balls into bins is the D choice process, where D bins are chosen uniformly at random and the ball is placed in the least loaded of the chosen bins. In most of these types of problems, we are interested in what we will call the gap which is the difference between the maximum and minimum loaded bins. The D-choice process was first studied by Azar et al. and has been heavily studied since and is very well known. For example, we know thanks to the works of Rob et al. that if D equals 1, which is just putting the ball in a random bin, the gap diverges as the number of balls increase. And also, it does so with a high probability. On the other hand, if D is greater than 1, so 2, 3 or more, then we know that in this case the gap converges also with a high probability. More recently, the graphical version of these processes was also analyzed by Perez et al. In this version, the bins are the vertices of a graph. And at each step, an edge is chosen, for example, this green edge, and the weight, which we show here by a ball, is placed in the least loaded of these two endpoints. For example, the two-choice process corresponds directly to the case where the graph is a complete graph. In this setting, it's been shown that the gap for beta expander graphs is big O of log n divided by beta with a high probability. Also, some of the same techniques were used in a cycle to achieve an upper bound of big O of n log n and a lower bound of omega log n. Closing this gap between the upper and lower bound estimates for cycle graphs is known to be a challenging problem. Another approach is to analyze load balancing in a static setting. In this case, each bin has an initial random load and at each step, an edge is chosen and the two endpoints average their loads. This setting has also been analyzed thoroughly in the discrete setting by Sawyerwald et al, where loads are considered to be a bunch of non-divisible tokens. If the number of tokens is odd, then one of them gets exactly one token more than the other. The problem we will tackle is a mix between these two approaches, where the graph is a cycle, and at each step, a weight is sampled from a weight distribution, and one edge is chosen at random. Then, the endpoints of this edge receive the weight and perform an averaging step. For example, if the weights of the two endpoints are L1 and L2, and the weight of the ball in this step is W, they will both become L1 plus L2 plus W divided by 2 after this step. We provide an upper bound of big O of square root times log for the expected gap and also a lower bound of omega of n for expected gap squared. Our proof of the results consists of two main ingredients. First, we introduce a new potential function, which we will call the hop potential function. These measure the squared differences in loads for bins with different hop lengths. We analyze these to find out how they change in each step. Afterwards, we leverage our findings on the hop potential functions and try to upper bound the gap. We achieve this using a technique we will call gap covering, which we will go over in more detail later on. Let's first take a look at what exactly the hop potential function is. The definition is simple. The k hop potential function is the sum of square differences of weights of nodes with a distance of exactly k. We will call the k hop potential function at time t phi k t. So for example, phi 1 at time t will be x1 at time t minus x2 at time t squared plus x2 at time t minus x3 at time t squared and so on. And phi 2 at time t will be x1 at time t minus x3 at time t squared plus x2 at time t minus x4 at time t squared, and so on. 
as we can see x1 at time t and x3 at time t denote our loads at time t in these respective bins and since bins 1 and 3 are distance of exactly 2 away from each other their differences squared will be included when computing phi 2 at time t since we choose our edge uniformly at random each edge of the cycle has a chance of 1 over n of being chosen by averaging over what the new hop function will be after choosing each edge we obtain the following equations by looking at this equation we can clearly see that the expected values of the k-hop functions after one step is a linear transformation of the values in the previous step plus some constant before continuing first we have to address what we're going to do with this expected value of w squared which you can see in this constant we know that w is sampled from a weight distribution According to the equations above, if this value goes to infinity and diverges, then the gap obviously diverges as well, which isn't very interesting. Else, if it has a value like m, then without any loss of generality, we can divide everything by m and just assume that it's 1. To reverse this effect, we just have to multiply everything by m at the end. By doing some calculations, it can be shown that the previous transformation has exactly one fixed point. If we name that fixed point phi prime, if we name that fixed point phi prime, then the kth value of phi prime will be k times n minus k minus 1. This observation helps us immensely, since we will use this to prove that our expected k half function values converge to these values as the number of balls increases. Also, due to how we've defined the half functions, phi k will always be equal to phi n minus k since if two nodes are a distance of k away from each other they are also a distance of n minus k away from each other if you look at it from the other side this is the reason we are only interested in the first half of them which are phi 1 until phi half of n these fixed point values thankfully also fit our expectations of this symmetry to put what we want to prove formally we prove two statements first is that the expected value of phi k at time t converges to phi prime k as t increases and second is that it will always remain less than phi prime k as well we accomplish this in three steps first we define state k at time t to be the difference between phi prime k and phi k at time t this comes from the fact that if we plug in both phi and phi prime into the transformation and decrease them from each other, we can eliminate all the constant factors and get a clean linear transformation between z values at time t plus 1 and at time t. Then, we prove that zk at time t are in an increasing order and are all positive as well, meaning that 0 is less than the expected value of z1 at time t which is also less than the expected value of z2 at time t, and so on. This will prove our second statement. And finally, we show that the largest of them all, which is z half of n at time t, converges to 0 as t increases. Combining this with the fact that they are all positives proves our first statement as well. Now that we've understood how the k-hop potential functions work, we'll try using them to prove an upper bound for the gap. We will only go over the method for n's which are powers of 2. The proof for the general n is a bit more fiddly and technical, but the main ideas for both proofs remain the same. We start with a couple of definitions. First, we define gap of A, where A is a subset of 1 to n, to be the gap if only considering nodes whose indices are in A. And second, we define A, K, I, to be the nodes which we will go through if we start from node i and jump around with a step size of 2 to the power of k. For example, here you can see the elements of a to 1 colored in green. These elements are elements we will go through if we start from node 1 and start jumping around with jump sizes of 4. So we'll go through 5, then 9, then 13, and then back to 1. Similarly, you can see that the elements of A to 1 are colored in purple. 
we can see that since n is a power of 2, then phi half of n at time t is the square sum of differences of the pair of nodes directly in front of each other in this cycle. So for this example, phi 8 at time t is basically x1 at time t minus x9 at time t squared plus x2 at time t minus x10 at time t squared and so on. Keep in mind that each one of these is counted twice since phi is the sum over all indices. And the question is that if we know the gap for a21 which are the green nodes and a23 which are the blue nodes can we somehow combine these two and upper bound the gap for all of the green and blue nodes together. This is the main idea which we will refer to as merging subsets. So the basic idea is that we want to somehow combine results for gaps on different disjoint subsets and get an upper bound for all of them together. The main lemma we'll prove in this section is this. At first sight, this might seem a little confusing, so we'll go through what the equation is saying using the previous example. In this case, since n is a power of 2, and your step sizes are also powers of 2, if you take your green nodes and shift them over using half of your step size, which is 2, then you reach the midpoints of each two adjacent green nodes, which are colored in blue. Now, what the lemma is trying to say is that twice the gap of all of the blue and green nodes together is always less than or equal to the sum of the gap of the green nodes plus the gap for the blue nodes plus twice the maximum differences between any two adjacent green and blue nodes. So that would be the difference between 1 and 3, 3 and 5, 5 and 7 and so on. The proof is by case analysis on the color of both the maximum and minimum of these nodes. We'll just go through one case for example. Let's say both the maximum and minimum values are green. For example, let's say node 1 is the minimum value and node 9 has the maximum value. Using the triangle inequality, we know that the difference between the load of node 1 and node 9 is always less than or equal to the difference between the loads of node 1 and 15 plus the difference in loads between node 15 and node 11 plus the difference between node 11 and node 9. But we know that the differences between node 9 and node 11 and also the difference between node 1 and node 15 are both less than the maximum differences between any two adjacent blue and green nodes. We also know that the differences between node 15 and node 11 are less than or equal to the gap of all these blue nodes. So that proves our lemma in this case. The other cases are also handled similarly, though there are a couple of small differences in how the triangle inequality is applied. The lemma allows us to basically double our subset by also including the center points. Ideally, we could start from opposite nodes on the cycle and double up over and over again till our subset consists of all the nodes. So the only thing remaining is to somehow upper bound the last term in the lemma, which would be the maximum differences between any green and blue nodes in the previous example. For this, we just have to use our k-hop results and by doing so, we get this inequality. Now, to sum up the proof, the lemma lets us double our subset. Our results from the k-op functions provide us with an upper bound on the term appearing in the lemma. And phi half of n at time t also gives us a good starting point, which are subsets of size 2 consisting of opposite nodes on the cycle. By using these all together, an upper bound of big O of square root times log can be achieved. So far, we've seen how the upper bound has been achieved, but the method never uses the fact that the k-hop functions converge to the fixed point. Instead, it only uses the fact that they are always less than the fixed point values. We will use these convergence results 
to achieve a lower bound on the expectation of gap squared. And we do this with these three simple steps. What we are trying to prove is that as the number of balls goes to infinity and increases, the expected gap squared is omega of n. The first and second facts are what we saw while analyzing the k op functions. The third fact is also an observation following the fact that each of these parentheses is less than gap squared. Putting these three together, we can easily get our lower bound. Finally, we have performed a couple of simulations to see how the algorithm will perform. We'll just quickly go through them here. We implemented the algorithm and ran it on a cycle with unit weights for graphs of different sizes. We plotted the gap divided by the square root of the size of the graph, and this was the result. It suggests that the gap is theta of n, since it always stayed between 1 and 1.4 in our experiments. I just want to finish off with some conclusions. I brought the results mentioned earlier. Moving forward, the next step would be applying these techniques, which are the hop functions and the gap covering technique, to more general graphs. We did think on this a bit, but could not find the right way to map these ideas onto a general graph, and figuring out this correspondence would be an interesting result. Another thing to think about is how we can extend this analysis to work with the two-choice process on the cycle. Our simulations show that indeed the averaging step performed doesn't really help that much, and without it, the ratio of gap divided by the square root of n is still bounded and behaves the same. So it would be interesting to see if we can somehow incorporate these ideas and use them to upper bound the gap in that scenario as well. That's pretty much all I have to talk about, and thank you so much for listening.